See, I've got my friend Rebecca Brewster on. Uh, we've got our friends from the Hyatt Patrol on. Uh, we have our friends from FMCSA on. We have our friends from DMV. So, you know, it looks like we're uh, we're getting ready to uh, to rock and roll here. And Mr. Jorgensen's going to come on at um, at ten. So, hey, let me go ahead and uh, let me go ahead and we'll just kind of get this started and just kind of, you know, give a little bit of a of an update on um, where we're at today in terms of this virus and, you know, what things are looking like. And, you know, there is a lot of great data out there. And I mean, I, I love data. Very happy today to have um, our friend Rebecca Brewster from the American Transportation Research Institute on. She's going to talk about some of the things that Atri has been doing um, in, in regards to COVID-19 and going to ask for your input as well. So this was last week. Last week, we had 535 folks in the Silver State positive. We had 10 deaths statewide. When you look at these numbers, and this is from 6.30 this morning, um, you can see that we have about tripled the number of positive folks here in Nevada, and um, you know we've we've gone from ten deaths to almost forty. So you know you, you can see that we are uh, you know we are trending up. Um, there is a lot of really interesting data out there. One that you know Fauci and uh, Dr. Bricks are citing comes from the Institute of Health Management and Education at the University of Washington. It's funded by Bill and Melinda Gates. And this is their data. And you can look right here. It talks about how many, how many beds we need across the, across the country. So you can see we've got a shortage, potentially, and this is at its peak, um, of 87,674 beds, uh, almost 20,000 ICU beds, and 31,782 ventilators. And that's nationwide. So this is really great because you can go and look at the different states and see how the different states across the country are doing. So of course, we want to look at Nevada. You know, how is Nevada doing right now? So when I look at Nevada, all beds needed 2,763. We've got 2,247. So that's a shortage of 516 beds, which doesn't sound impossible to me in the silver state with a lot of empty casinos and dorms you know that's something where you look at that and you go okay we're really not in as bad a shape as we are and once again this is these are data projections don't know how true this is going to be we'll talk about some of this some of this later uh 332 ventilators um require more than more than we have um Let's take a look at some of the other states. So Arizona, you know, Arizona, you know, they, they need more ventilators than we do, but in terms of beds, they're a lot better off than Nevada. So they don't have a bed shortage. Uh, they need 95 extra beds for ICU. When you look at California, you know, California ventilators, they need about 1500 ventilators. Um, when you hear about the companies that are making ventilators, um, you know, this doesn't look like we're really gonna we're really gonna be in as bad a shape as we may be. And once again, these are projections. So, you know, where 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 have we heard of the big problem happening? We've heard of the big problem happening in New York. And here's the data from New York right now. And this will just show you how bad a shape New York is in compared to a number of the other states. So right now in New York, they need an additional 63,120 beds, ICU beds over 11,000, uh, 9,427 ventilators. So that just kind of gives you an idea of why the focus is on New York and how Nevada and some of the other states are doing. Uh, we're gonna put this website link up on our homepage if you wanna go and take a look at this data. Now, once again, these are projections. Now. How far are these projections, um, how, how close are they to being true? Well, when you look at this, and this is on COVID compared, 
And like I said, I'm a big data guy. I love data. So if you look at how accurate they've been, um, the estimates, what they thought they needed compared to what they actually need, they have been extremely overstated. So this starts on March 25th, and you can see they overstated the amount of beds that they would need or hospitalizations uh, by 353%. Now, I kind of like that number because it's like, hey, maybe it's not as bad as we're gonna think it is. But then when I see this kind of downward trend, as we see the number of hospitalizations increase, and as time goes on, we're seeing this number get closer and closer to being true. So maybe their data is off by a week, maybe it's off by a couple of weeks. Um, but we can just kind of see this downward trend where as time goes on, that number is getting closer and closer to accurate. So I, I'd love to see it go back up that, you know, we're, we're, uh, we're not going to have what we, uh, what we've anticipated, but that's kind of where we're at today. Data is very important, not just for how we treat and fight this disease, but it's also important for our industry. You know, this is a time that I don't think any of us ever anticipated we'd been, we, we would live through the impact that it's had on our industry has been very substantial. And I just want to say thank you to everybody who has, you know, been out there, your employees, been out there making sure that all of us get, get everything that we need. And we want to get you what you need to. So, you know, we have had a lot of requests for PPE. We've got gloves. We have hand sanitizer. Uh, Frey Ranch donated some hand sanitizer to us. I have my wife and kids yesterday bottling, uh, bottling up a couple hundred bottles. So, you know, we've been giving that out. We're going to send that send out to the to the folks that have um, requested some. We're going to get that in today. Um, but in terms of data and our industry, we're very blessed to have. My good friend Rebecca Brewster on our on our webinar today, and she's going to talk about some of the data that they're seeing um, in terms of the impact on our industry, and then also a request from everybody on this phone to uh, to fill their survey out. Rebecca, thanks, Paul. And, uh, I too love data, so this is uh, certainly an unprecedented time, and and it gives us an incredible research opportunity. So uh, first, with some analysis we did and released last week, uh, as you know from our bottleneck list, Atri has what is, without a doubt, the nation's largest database of truck GPS data. We have over a million commercial trucks represented in our database. The, the data comes into us in real time, and we're able to do a whole host of analyses with that data. So we wanted to see what the data was showing in terms of truck flows and truck speeds as a result of sort of what's happening with everyone sheltering in place and staying at home. So we took uh, four locations around the country. The one you've got up here is one that we looked at in Los Angeles at the intersection of uh, 710 and 105. And we compared the third week in March in 2018 truck speeds uh, the third week in March in 2019, and then the third week in March this year. And as you can see here in a normal rush hour, particularly at this location, the morning rush hour is, is the worst. And truck speeds typically average less than 25 miles per hour as a result of congestion. But when you look at uh, what they're doing uh, third or what they were doing third week in March this year, trucks were averaging about 53 miles per hour in the morning rush hour. And this uh, data is not unlike what we're seeing in other locations around the country. We did one where I live here in Atlanta. It's typically the, the second worst bottleneck in the country. We call it Spaghetti Junction locally. Uh, but here uh, for the afternoon rush hour, trucks typically average about 14 miles per hour because the congestion is so significant there. Uh, but this third week in March, we were seeing truck speeds averaging uh, just over 53 miles per hour there as well. So if there is a silver lining to this situation we're in, it's the fact that uh, many, many four-wheelers are staying at home and leaving the roads for uh, the, the nights of the highway and the, the truckers who are doing what they need to do to, to keep the supply chain moving. So a good bit of data to share and, and certainly something we're going to continue to look at uh, as this 
continues to, to move throughout the U.S. And so uh, to the data request now, Paul, as you know, last week we also launched a survey because this is a unprecedented time. So certainly an unprecedented opportunity for us on the research side to collect data from fleets and from professional drivers on what impacts you're seeing in your business day to day. And so uh, in conjunction with uh, OIDA and their foundation, we launched a survey last week to ask trucking fleets, what are you seeing out there? What, ha what has changed about your operations under COVID-19 relative to what it was before we knew what COVID-19 was? Things like average length of haul, uh, congestion, truck parking, and other issues that we deal with on a daily basis, but may have in fact be have been impacted. And so we've had a tremendous response to this survey. In just a week, we have uh, over 3,000 responses to this survey, which is just incredible for us. And so I appreciate those of you on the webinar who have already taken the survey. But if you have not, I hope you will take a few minutes to do so. You can get it on our website at truckingresearch.org, and I know Paul will share that with you later. Uh, won't take you a long time, it's not a very long survey, and as it is with all of our surveys, your data will be confidential, it's just gonna be aggregated with all the other data. But we're gonna turn this data analysis around much quicker than we typically do at ATRI, uh, because this is such a timely topic, and I know folks wanna understand how this is impacting carriers and drivers across the country. So uh, just a, a a pitch again to, to take a few minutes to do the survey and please encourage your drivers to do so as well. Now, uh, right now we're running at about 75% driver responses and uh, about 25% uh, motor carrier uh, personnel. So everyone, uh, please take a few minutes to do that. We really want your input. Thanks, Paul. Hey, Rebecca, thank you very much. And uh, good to see you from Atlanta, Georgia. Absolutely. Good to see you too. Stay safe. Hey, thank you very much. Anybody have any questions for Rebecca while I have her on here? You lucked out, Brewster. All right. Thanks, Paul. Hey, thank yeah. you. All right. Let's uh, let's go and do our um, our update from our uh, from our agency partners. Um, Let's talk to uh, Mr. Benz Miller with the uh, Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration. Bill? Oh, I know I saw Bill on. All right, let me see. Yeah. There can we you are. Can hear me now, Paul? I can. Okay, thanks, Paul. Uh, not much today. I've only got three items, uh, actually two. Um, and hopefully, hopefully it will screw you up, Paul, but uh, one is uh, just, we've come out with a few updates on our website. Again, like last week, there's a lot of misinformation out there. Please contact Paul and I if you have any questions about what the real truth of the matter is as far as like travel restrictions and things of that nature. Uh, our website's been updated with information about TSA has addressed some of their credentialing for hazard materials. I'm sure DMV will talk about that a little bit. And last but not least, I'd like to take a minute or so, Paul, here just to uh, say we lost one of our friends last week with the Highway Patrol, and Sergeant Ben Jenkins was killed in the line of duty. And I'd like to, he worked with us in commercial, great person to work with. It's a tragedy. We, we under, under, underestimate the risk that these guys take, and I really appreciate the lieutenant that's on today. And I'd like to just have a moment of silence for Sergeant Ben Jenkins right now. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Hey, Bill, thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions for Mr. Benz Miller, FMCSA? Hey, hey, Bill, Bruce McRae, uh, UPS. And let us know if the family needs anything. Um, let Paul know, and uh, uh, I would definitely uh, personally uh, give dollars to that and see what we can do as a company, too, because that's just, uh, that's just tragic. So please keep us informed of that. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, they've got... Um, They've got a direct donation site, and they also have a couple of fundraisers going on. I'll let the lieutenant talk about it when he gets on, if he has the information. If not, we'll send it to you, okay? Thank you, sir. Hey, thank you. 
Any other questions for Mr. Benzmiller? All right, well, let's go to our friends of the Nevada High Patrol. Lieutenant Plowman. All right. I don't know. Do I have do I have Lieutenant Plamon on? Maybe I don't have Don on yet. There we are. Oh, there you are. Can you hear me? I can. All right. Hey, uh, just want to take a moment to to uh, thank Bill for that tribute to Sergeant Jenkins. It it has been a trying time for the department all week. We're dealing with this. And, uh, Paul's group has been wonderful as well. Um, I'll send out an email. I sent it out to Jerry, you know, or Jerry. I think Jerry sent it out, but it, they have a, a couple fundraisers that they're doing for like T-shirts, and then there's uh, IPOF. Vegas is is a good site. We're trying to eliminate some of the scammers out there that try to take advantage of these types of situations. Uh, but there's two two bank accounts that you can donate directly to the IPOF and uh, that t-shirt fundraiser deal where it's the, the proceeds go directly to, to the family but I can email that out to Paul if we need and he can send it out that'll, that'll be great this is uh, again Bruce from UPS yeah, and, and I know my friends from FedEx will do the same thing so uh, we will definitely uh, be involved Happy to do that. I appreciate and, that. Hey, Godspeed to you guys and, uh, you know, High Patrol family, Don. Um, um, any other than that, I don't, I don't really have much different. Or, uh, I mean, obviously this week has been difficult, like I said, and uh, our focuses have been more towards uh, maintaining a visual deterrent, mobile roving type enforcement as, as needed. Um, I'm not in... The question came out about uh, hazmat yesterday, and I have not seen any. The only thing I've seen come out about hazmat was for uh, some cylinders. It was the DOT SP 2105 that came out. There's only two companies that are running that. It was Air Gas and AGL Welding Supply. And it was basically giving them relief for, uh, it was allowing them to refill cylinders that were overdue and transport them throughout during this emergency but i'm not aware of any other hazmat relief that's come about our hazmat <coughs> section is still up and running because it's mainly online it's we're in that alliance with uh, michigan oklahoma and west virginia and that's mainly online based like i said so we don't interact with the public directly so hazmat permits are still up and running for the highway patrol um other than that i I really don't have much much else that unless there's some questions for me. Are we? This is Bruce again, UPS, and, and I think one of the biggest questions we have, um, and I know Paul's already sent it out in regards to the DMV, uh, but training our drivers. Our drivers, many of our drivers have already been through the training classes and getting their uh, CDLs uh, for doubles. Um, you know, they've already got it for singles. Uh, can we continue with that, or is that just frozen right now? Or would you know? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I'm not sure. I think I think Don might be able to answer that a little better as far as whether they're allowed to. Well, but hey, thought, for a for that. a hook, let's go ahead and uh, we'll go to uh, our friend in Motor Carrier. And you know, I did send this information out. You know, I know we've had a lot of questions about how the DMV is going to be operating. Um, you know, everything from <clears throat> registration to you know how they're going to handle. Um, licenses and new folks coming in. I know Don can talk a little about that. We may have somebody else from DMV on um, who can who can answer that, who can answer some of those questions. Don, I'll let you go ahead. Thank you, Paul. Can you hear me? I can. And I can see it right there at the beautiful- Can Gold you hear Bridge. me? Can you hear me, Paul? Yes. Okay, sorry, it's cutting in and out on mine. I don't know if it's just my video feed or if it's everybody that's having that problem. Um, to answer the question on the hazmat, uh, Julie indicated that uh, we got word this morning that TSA has authorized states to issue extensions on the hazmat endorsements. 
and that Thomas Martin is going to be drafting a notice to that effect and putting it on the DMV uh, website in a separate email. So yeah. that's the only information that I have on the hazmat. And as far as the drivers are concerned, until the office is operational again, the only thing that we had the ability to do was extend existing credentials. So if they already have a, a, a CDL permit or some other type of um, endorsement on their license, they can continue to operate with that even if it's expired. But if they need to add new endorsements or they need to actually get the CDL license, they have to wait till the offices are open. Unfortunately, it's kind of fluid still. And so our, our target right now is May 4th based on the governor's um, um, extension to April the 30th. But um, we are looking at whether, how we will roll that out, whether it will be done through appointments, whether they're gonna add Saturdays um, to catch up on the backlog. And right now that's still, it's gonna be dependent upon what the governor says as far as um, social distancing, how, how are we going to perform these duties going forward until the threat has been uh, basically mitigated in Nevada. So that's... Thank you, that's what I needed to hear. I, think, I appreciate it. Don, you froze up a little bit. All right. Uh, anybody have any any other questions on the DMV for Don? I do have one question. This is Laura Perry with Western Turf. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, there is uh, the issue of the overweight permits. You know, we had some changes where the, the permitting was done with the registration. However, when I was doing the permitting, the, the DMV wasn't quite ready for that. And uh, we were to look at it again in January, February. What are we doing with that? I still have one truck that I can't get the permit on because we want to do it registration wise. Are we just holding off on that for a while? So Paul, I don't know. I think I lost my connection. I don't know at what point. Okay. Hey, yeah. Um, we, we have a question about the, about the LCV permits and being able to, well, it's not a Paul, you're kind of cutting should... in and out. Sorry. Okay, let's try that. Don, can you hear me? I can hear you now. Okay. We have a question about increasing your your weight so you can get a so you can get an LCV. Yes, you can increase. I have staff working in the office. So you can you can increase your weight, you can add vehicles, you can set up a new account. Um, we're just trying to keep everybody operational. Okay, so for my, um, hi Don, uh, I, this is Laura at Western Turf and I was asking that question. I happen to have a vehicle um, that, with, with our rock vehicles that are, um, need those overweight. Right. We're not doing the permits anymore, we're doing it via the registration. And Correct. We had registered in December and I could not correct that yet. Can I, can I correct it now? Yes, if you if you send an email, Laura, to the MCTLC, okay, at dmv.nv.gov email, staff is monitoring that every day. So just let them know your account number and what you need, and they'll get back. Perfect. To you. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, fantastic. Any other questions for our friends of the DMV? Don, can you hear me? This is Lita Brooks from UPS. Hi, Lita, I can. Good. Back to the devil's training, and I, I'm sorry to hit on this again, but I'm getting conflicting information from other states. I'm the, I'm the region training and compliance manager for the West Coast, and there are other states that are stating that if, if information is uploaded into systems, that the devil's training can continue as long as the trainer is still with the uh, trainee. Is that a state by state? So Lita, I'm gonna have to ask that question because I don't know the answer. I don't work in the CDL part. It's, that's done in a separate 
division. So um, I'm going to ask, and I will, through Paul, I'll get back with you on that. That'd be great, thank you. The yeah, second we'll, question we'll would be- answer and we'll put that, we'll put that out on our, uh, on our, daily, on our daily brief. So I just thank wanna you. make understand, Lita, so you're asking if they've already got um, a permit to do doubles as long as they're with their trainer and it's loaded in CSTEM, is that the question? Yes, our, our drivers take the test uh, before they're put into training. So they'll take the, the doubles test, but obviously that credential is not on their permit. So once they've taken the CDL exam through a third party administrator, upload the information into CSTEMS, the only thing they don't have is the hard copy CDL. So at that point in other locations, they're allowing doubles training to, uh, to ensue. Okay, I will find that out and I will get back with you on that. Thank you. Hey, Don, any... we also have a, a question on the Zoom chat from um, Millard. Is, is there any plan on um, delaying the first quarter if defiling? No. My understanding is IFTA has allowed um, the transmittal for February and March to be rolled into the April one that gets done at the end of May, but we are not extending the IFTA filing. Now, with that said, if there's a hardship that a company has faced and they just aren't able to file it, we are asking that they just provide us something that indicates why they weren't able to file it, and those will be looked at on a case-by-case -case basis, but at this point, there's been no no authority, nor do we have authority in the IFTA agreement to do that. I know Indiana has, and I questioned them on how they did it, and they said they just did it. So I don't know, but we haven't been given that authority. Well, I, I will say kind of the, you know, once again, silver linings, right? I, I have been amazed and heartened by how flexible everyone is being, you know, especially here in the Silver State, in terms of doing everything they can for our industry to make sure that we can still operate. So, you know, I, I just, you know, I want to thank everyone from, you know, and really it's been at all levels of government from our friends of the FMCSA, the Nevada High Patrol, DMD, um, NDOT. Um, it has been, it has been amazing to see how flexible and amenable everyone has been to every request that we've had. So, you know, I just, I want to say thank you on that. Um, I know we have some folks from NDOT on. Are there any updates from our, from our friends at NDOT? All right. Guess not. So, Hey, since, you know, it looks like we're rolling um, just right on time. Um, we are very, very fortunate today on the, you know, really the first day of this rollout to uh, be able to have somebody from the SBA on here. And today we have Rod Jorgensen, who is the Director of Counseling for the Nevada Small Business Center of the SBA. Um, you know, once again, I just want to say how phenomenal Nevada is. I know my colleagues in all the other states, we, we talk once a week. And I don't know if any of them have been successful in getting someone from the SBA to present to their, to their groups yet. So, you know, that's a huge uh, shout out to uh, our friends of the SBA here in Nevada and Rod and Sam Mails. Thank you guys so much. I, I just want to say how much we appreciate you on the first day of this rollout where there's still a lot of questions and, you know, how this is going to work to have you on here. It means a tremendous amount to me. You know, I saw uh, an email from the Las Vegas Chamber of Commerce. They have Catherine Cortez Masto, and I like her a lot, nice lady, but I'd rather hear it from our folks who are right in there. So I feel like we got a much better get than the senior senator from Nevada <laughs> with, with Rod. So, hey, Rod, thank, thank you very much. Um, gonna talk about a couple of programs today. We also have our accountants from Casey Nealon on to talk about some of the tax consequences. Darcy <clears throat> Casey, Lucas Gonzalez, you know, they can answer some of the, the tax questions. But um, Raj, should we just go ahead and start out on the, the Paycheck Protection Program? 
Let's, uh, Paul, if we can, let's start off on the economic injury disaster loan because that'll go quicker. Okay. Um, and we are a partner with the SBA. I don't work directly for the SBA. Small business development centers are in every state in the nation. And one of the, the common funding partner across the country is in fact the SBA. So we, we stay pretty closely tied with them and responsible to them. And I will tell you right now, not to ballyhoo ourselves, but uh, the phone rings, we hang up, it rings, we hang up. It's gone on all day, all week. And we are the only place right now where people can call and actually find someone who will answer the phone. And it's not because officials at the SBA offices are are just idly sitting there. It's just because they're absolutely slammed. The uh, as of a couple of days ago, there had already been more than two million applications for this economic injury disaster loan, and they have a finite staff that are trained on disaster loans. So, unfortunately, this process could take some time for most. Everyone that has been negatively affected should apply for an economic injury disaster loan. And at a minimum, when you're applying, because they have a new website that went live, it's either this last Monday or the Monday before, it's a much quicker process. The old, the old process was two to two and a half hours. The new process is maybe 15, 20, 25 minutes. The, one of the keys to the economic injury disaster loan is there is now a checkbox where you can request an advance of $10,000. Everything that I have read is that $10,000 is a grant to you, the business that is, the, is applying. There, have been, there has been some information floating out there that if you are declined for the economic injury disaster loan, that the $10,000 becomes a grant, and that if you are approved for the economic injury disaster loan, the $10,000 becomes part of the loan. That is not documenting anything that I have read up through this morning. All other sources would say that the $10,000 is a gift to the business owner. The EIDL, no one that has applied yet, which applications started uh, three weeks and three days ago, no one yet has, has uh, talked with a case manager. You do not put in how much you are requesting into this economic injury disaster loan, you are awaiting a call from a case manager to discuss how much you should apply for. The common rule of thumb would be on the economic injury disaster loan side of things, you would apply for roughly six months worth of all overhead. That is from gross profit down to the bottom line. I would say excluding payroll. And the reason I say excluding payroll is because we're going to be talking about that when we talk about the, the paycheck, the, the PPP. I'm just going to call it the PPP instead of repeating it. Um, so there are a lot of expenses that most businesses incur on a monthly basis and are still incurring outside of payroll. So you could still use the economic injury disaster loan for those other expenses. What you're attempting to do by getting six months worth of overhead is give you enough coverage to be able to stay alive, if you would, through the breadth of this, even if we're all fat and happy, well, we'll all be fat. We may not be happy, but we're all gonna be fat by early June. Um, the interest rate, as you can see, is 3.75. They're going to make them all 30-year loans. Uh, the SBA is required to look for any available collateral on any loans above $25,000 and you will have to provide personal guarantees. My fear is that most financial institutions at this point are going to be pretty gun shy on, on lending. They're just gonna become, have, have become much more conservative. It's just the nature of the beast. As you can see, there is an option there to defer the first year of principal and interest payments. So you could get a, a capital injection into your business, treat it dearly, Keep paying your expenses until we roll out of this thing. So before we move on, I'd like any questions on this economic injury disaster loan portal. All right, so we have a question. Um, 
from Kelly. Um, she's asking, if I already applied for the economic injury disaster loan and did not check that $10,000 advance, can she go back and edit it to add that? Okay, the old version, which locked up by the end of the first week, um, you went in and you created a username and password. So that allowed you access, but the checkbox was not in there. Anybody that applied under the old website needs to go back in and reapply. The new site does not have a username and password. So if you use the new site, am I yelling? You sound good to me, buddy. Okay. But hey, people I get a little yelling too. So I get a little worked up. If you applied under the new website, there is no mechanism by which you can go back in and hit that checkbox. You are going to have to wait until you can speak with your case manager. And I say, at that point, you say, I am requesting the advance. Okay. Any other questions on this topic? Oh, one thing I would say is originally when it rolled out, they, they did not want, they really were attempting to get businesses less than one year old. They were trying to say, nah, don't apply. You're not going to qualify. They've kind of broadened that and are allowing businesses under a year old to apply. I don't know what the success rate is going to be. Second, if your FICO score, credit score is under 600, it's pretty slim chances you're going to be approved for this. Uh, I have a, a question from uh, our accountant, Casey Neeland. Darcy, um, what date did the new website come up? I, I, it was either, I think it was a week ago last Monday. So it's been like 12 days now. And I know we saw some articles in the Wall Street Journal that, you know, it was overloaded. I mean, it kind of got off to a rocky start, but are things progressing now fair, you know, in a easier manner? I'm not hearing anyone that can't get on the site and complete the application. Fantastic. Any more questions on the economic injury disaster loan before we move to the paycheck protection program? All right. This one is a doozy. Let me go back to the yeah this one this one is a doozy this has been a grand okay. this whole thing this whole thing has been one week less a little less than one week since since congress approved this bill and uh a lot of things have changed in that period of time and i've still got some unanswered questions that i really can't seem to speak to anybody who can give me these answers paycheck protection program Okay, the old information out there said that if you're a business that has, in, has been in business for let's say a year and a half or longer, you're going to use February 15th to June 30th of 2019. You're going to calculate your average payroll. You're gonna multiply that times 2.5 and that's the amount of money you're going to apply for. It has now changed where you're going to use all of 2019 you're going to average the payroll, and by payroll, I, I mean payroll that is an expense category within the body of your expenses, if that makes any sense. So if you're an entity where ownership is on payroll, you will include your, pay, your portion of that payroll in this calculation. So you're going to take your average of all monthly of all your payroll last year, come up with the monthly average. The application is now pretty much online with most all of the banks. It's going to allow you to take that average times 2.5 and that's the amount you're going to request. And once again, so this is different than other SBA loans. I mean, this is this is fully forgiven. And, you know, I know one of the, you know, one of the concerns from a number of folks, you know, before we saw some of this come out last week was, you know, personal guarantees and collateral. No, there will, there are no personal guarantees on this. This loan is 100% guaranteed to the issuing bank. <laughs> a few things. 
<coughs> that have changed. As of, uh, as of this morning, the interest rate is now 1%. And it will be for two years, up to two years. One anticipates that if, let's say my average payroll is 50K, my application can be two and a half times that, so it's gonna be $125,000. Over the next eight weeks, I'm going to expend the vast majority of that $125,000 on payroll and other items, but it will exclude federal payroll taxes because there's already a prior stimulus for that. At the end of the eight weeks, if you can document to the bank that you have expended it at least 75% of this money on payroll, this loan will be forgiven. Effectively, what will happen is the SBA will pay the bank off, including the 1% interest. So, I mean, and that's the key. So while you can use it for utilities, for rent, for, you know, you know, mortgage interest, you know, leases, some of those things, You'll want to make sure that when you're taking money from this program, that at least three quarters of it is being used specifically for those for those payroll costs. If and you, I mean, I can just you know kind you of do not, on this. if you do not use seventy five percent of it for payroll costs, there is a specific limited. It's up here now. Grouping of expense items you can use this money for. If you use this money outside of those bounds, it can be classified as fraud. Okay, so when we talk about payroll costs, Rod, I've got this right up here. So, you know, that includes salary, wages, commissions, tips, capped at $100,000. That includes employee benefits for vacation, parental leave, family or sick leave. Um, Retirement, uh, 401k contributions. 401k, severance pay. Now it does include, you know, it doesn't include the federal taxes, but you can take like a modified business tax here in Nevada, your payroll tax, you can apply that. And then if you're a sole proprietor, you know, it's a little bit of a different process. And you know, I, I know we have owner operators here in the in the trucking industry, so you know it is it is a you know a little a little different for them, and you know for for them they've got they can't apply today like everybody else can. They have to wait until uh, the the tenth of April, so a week from today for your sole proprietors and your independent contractors to apply. Uh, yes, <clears throat> here is uh, okay. I'm getting ahead of myself, but. Here's one of the issues that I am trying to get clarification on that I haven't yet. That is, everything talks about payroll, which is an expense item. A lot of sole proprietors, small business owners, independent contractors take their compensation out of net profit. The most recent thing I got today, hopefully, allows those individuals that take their compensation out of net profit to qualify for this because in the partial final regulations that came out today, and I'm trying to find where that, where it is, the verbiage reads like, if I can provide the bank other documentation that shows how I compensate myself, that can be sufficient to allow me to qualify for the PPP. Prior to today, I didn't have that documentation. It always said payroll. Well, payroll is an expense category. Um, so I'm hoping that 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 that, that helps. Um, I feel like in the last week I've got a PhD on this stuff. Uh, two and a half times, all of the applications are out there. Most there is a list of approved or of eligible SBA lenders that is floating around. The interesting thing is none of the big dogs, B of A, US, Wells, et cetera, et cetera, are on that list. We're trying to, we're trying to get clarification on that because they're more like national banks, if you would, or the breadth of their services are national versus being a local bank. If you pull up the list and you look at uh, Nevada, there's, and you specifically look at Las Vegas, there's like five banks there and they're all community banks. But yet pretty much everybody is gonna be on board at least to the length 
of their own customer base. And they're all pretty much going to have a portal that you go to uh, where you're completing this application process. The requirement by the bank will be that they see sufficient documentation to be able to attest to what your average monthly payroll was. On, on, that's on the front end. Um, you will apply. I think what's going to happen is they're going to get it on the back end. You're going to apply through the portal. Every bank's going to have a department somewhere in the country that is mass processing these. Then if you're successful at getting it, on the back end, you're going to have to provide documentation of, okay, here, here was why I applied for X. And now, and so make me the loan. And then eight weeks later, here's all my documents as to where I spent that money. So please forgive it. And so, you know, once, once again, to that, to that point, Rod, so you need to, you need to certify and verify that you do need this loan. And, you know, these are the, the following provisions that you're going to need to attest to um, on, on why you need the loan, that you are going to be using this money from the loan, from the PPP program to keep your workers, maintain payroll, make those mortgage, lease, and utility payments, um, that you're not going to receive another loan under this program. Where does that come in, Rod? Does that come in if you have multiple businesses? No, there's only, you can only apply once for this program. Uh, under that EIN. Okay. Right? Okay. So if I have, I have two, I own two franchises. I own a, a KFC and I own a a and I could apply for both because each one has its own EIN. Got it. Uh, this may... The banks are going to allow applications to flow upstream. We may have a delay in processing of these applications because none of the banks yet have agreements in place with the SBA on this. So it'll, to, the, to the applicant, this will seem seamless because they completed it and it went away, but it, it might take till Monday or Tuesday for the SBA to have those agreements in place. Cause I was communicating with an SBA lender this morning and he had said that, and I had seen a national news report from a, uh, uh, an association for banks. And they said, Whoa, we're not doing these until we have, we have documents in place. We don't have those yet. I'm going to cut, I'm going to cut the SBA some slack cause <laughs> they're all working 24 seven. Well, I mean, I, Hey, I will tell you, it's not very often that, I have faith in government and some of these programs, but you know, watching, watching um, the head of the SBA yesterday, watching Secretary Mnuchin, you know, be able to go out there and talk about this and answer these questions, I felt a lot better afterwards. And it's not usually, you know, it's not usual that a politician will make me do that. But you know, it it sounds like they're doing everything they can to work with folks to ensure that you can keep your employees that you can still make all of those payments to continue your, your, your business. Um, oops, sorry. It, it, it doesn't, it, it never happens and it need, it does need to happen. It never happens that within a week you have all these new programs that are literally on the verge of being able to go live. And it's because the money needs to get out there quickly. And so there, everybody's pushing everybody to move this forward, to get money in the hands of consumers, of workers, of et cetera. All right, so we went through what qualifies as a payroll cost. Um, you know, loan info, I mean, once again, this is, you know, this is important. The loan, it's for, it's a two month loan, right? Yeah, it's a, it's a it two, well, it can be up to two years. Let's say that there was a deficit there that wasn't forgiven. The balance would be payable over two years, but you get a six month deferral. Wait a second, or is this one a year? Uh, no, this one's six months. Six month deferral. Uh, uh, Treasury said it should be two years at 1%. That's what it's going to be. You use best efforts not to expend any more than 25% on those categories other than payroll. Now, if you have expended on those categories other than payroll, but it falls within the bounds 
of those allowable categories, interest on mortgage, interest on other loans, utilities, rents, et cetera, you, simply what will happen is the whole loan won't be forgiven. And you'll end, up, you'll end up with a loan payment for the balance of two years. That's not such a bad thing either in these times. All right, I'm going to open it up to, uh, to questions for Mr. Jorgensen. Uh, Mr. Jorgensen, can you hear me? Yep. Um, okay, so I, I'm confused a little bit. So, I'm confused too. Okay, good. Well, I'm, now I'm, I'm, I, it's nice to not feel alone. So if you're an ongoing concern and you can put employees to work, then that means you should be able to get paid for your services and make payroll. So, and if you, and if you aren't able to work, let's say you're a restaurant, and so arguably you could use this money to continue to pay people, but if there's nothing to yep. buy as a service, yep. so, all right, so I'm interested in applying because I don't know when the other shoe might fall. Yeah. So is this just a matter of still, I mean, obviously I, I can, I've got a payroll account. I can demonstrate that I'm making payroll. Is that the criteria that is the standard? Yes, it is. And the way I'm looking at this is if you yourself are on payroll, at least by getting this, you could maintain your own income for a couple of months. But it may be the case where there's really no need to rehire staff because what would they do? Right. Right? So, you right, would, so I don't understand this one. But well, so what would happen is, is you could actually lower the amount that you're requesting to that level where it was only paying you. You're not required to apply for 250% of your average monthly payroll. You could use a number south of that. So I guess what I'm nervous about is, you know, we don't know what the criteria on the back end really looks like when they're gonna start scrutinizing whether you used it appropriately. I mean, are they, is it a need? Cause you know, they're not asking for net profit. So do, are they going to be scrutinizing the need? Or are they going to be scrutinizing the use or both? Right now, as of today, they're going to be looking at all loans where it is, in fact, payroll. Ab above the net profit line is an expense. So if you yourself are on payroll, you will qualify over the next eight weeks because you're going to cut yourself a check from payroll. Next week is when independent contractors and self-employed can apply. Okay. My, um, may I my instincts tell me, and I might be wrong, and I have a week to figure this out, is that if you compensate yourself out of net profit, cut yourself a distribution or a draw, if you would, as long as you can document that that is an eligible payroll activity as of next week. That's my instincts, but I don't know that for certain. My question is kind of similar to Laura's. I'm not sure if you can hear me okay. Yeah. Um, it, so we are an essential business and we are remaining open, which sounds like similar to what Laura is talking about. If we do not have to lay anybody off, and obviously we're still being affected by the, the virus and AR slowing down, will our payroll that we're paying our employees that are still working still be forgiven yes 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 so even if they're still working and we're still paying them they don't have to necessarily be on layoff and bring them back for us to no no this is a keep people working bill or if you've laid them off and it is logical to bring them back to get them back to work and the u.s government is going to be covering their payroll for the next eight weeks Okay, and then if we do have to lay off employees, is there any ideal time to lay them off or bring them back that, that this is covering? I didn't see anything on a limitation of the time period that this is going to be covering, or maybe I missed that. Well, uh, what I read is the eight-week time frame will start from the date you get the loan. And you can go up until June 30th to get the loan. Yes, yes. And Wonderful. you have until June 30th to rehire anybody that you've laid off to qualify for this loan. Yes, the challenge here is this is a first come first serve program and it was 347 billion, but I don't know how long it's going to last. 
Does that make sense? You can, I mean, if you think about payroll costs in the United States and how many businesses will apply, I guess, I guess you could run through 347 billion pretty quickly. Well, I, and I mean, there was a rationale behind picking that number. I mean, that was, yeah. you know, the thought of, yeah. hey, we want to cover the payroll costs for these small businesses, these under 500. So, I mean, they did, you know, Congress did do some math in determining what that right amount was that would cover the, what is it, 30 million small businesses that are out there. Yeah. And, you know, to ensure that you could keep your payroll costs up for two months. So, you know, I mean, they just didn't pick this number out of the air. There was some, you know, there was some deliberation in it. Uh, some some, some uh, businesses, because, I mean, I guess in theory, it would have been nice if we had, the, in, re, in, the, in Nevada, if we had this a few weeks ago, right, before people started laying people off. At this juncture, though, there are some industries where they've laid staff off. The staff that are laid off are now in the unemployment system, and they're looking at they're getting the regular unemployment plus $600. And they're going, well, why would I come back to work? I'm making more money sitting on the couch than I am working for you. And, and that's just, it's just what happened. In other cases, I had a, uh, uh, an auto mechanic that had two staff. I talked to him on Wednesday. He had just laid those two off. I explained the PPP to him. He said, well, I can bring them back. We're down to about 50% of our normal volume. So they will not be fully working. And I said, have them work on what they can, have them clean up the shop, bring them back. You, the owner who is on payroll, will get yourself paid for the next eight weeks. You will be able to pay them for the next eight weeks. And at the end of that eight weeks, things have not started to normalize, then they'll go back and reapply for unemployment insurance. In the meantime, whatever work you're doing at the mechanic shop, you'll be able to, you're not having to pay labor now because the US government's paying it. You can set that money aside to help you pay other bills that are coming up. All right, Rod got a question. Does the 500 employee count still include temporary employees that are sourced from an employment or staffing company? Aye, aye, aye. I apologize. I haven't, I have not looked at that. I have not looked at that. I'm sorry. I don't have that answer. All I, right. Hey, my gut would tell well, me it's 500 FTEs. 500 FTEs? That's what my gut would say. Okay. Scott, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll work on getting a good answer for you. I might be able to help in that concept. I applied for this loan this morning and um, we use a payroll service for all of our employees. And that did not hinder us in any way as long as they were full-time um, constant employees. It does confuse it a little bit. You do have to let them know immediately, hey, I'm using a payroll service because when, the, you know, when they're filing, they use their, their one EIN number and they in, include all of, all of their uh, different customers. But um, as long as, as I understood it from my accountants and bankers this morning, same thing, as long as you are keeping your people on paying your regular payroll. And uh, so I jumped on that this morning and I don't think that is an issue. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. We've also got um, we've also got our our friends from uh, Casey Nealon on. Darcy Lucas, do you guys have anything to add that may kind of help folks navigate this um, th these programs? Yeah. Hi. This is Darcy Casey from Casey Nealon. Um, yeah. We. Uh, you know. Again, as as Rod said, a lot of this is um being figured out as we go along um i'm with him in terms of the self-employed and, and somebody who is an owner in an llc that ultimately i believe you know those whatever your guarantee payment is what you're pulling out um to pay yourself is ultimately going to be part of this program um as far as um the calculation for um the the benefit that the loan that you can receive it's our understanding through our partners at the um, American Institute of Certified Public Accountants that 
you know, not only is it just payroll, um, it does exclude the payroll taxes, but it, it also includes um, state unemployment, state and federal unemployment taxes. It includes possibly modified business tax um, and workers comp, as well as definitely health insurance and um, retirement plan benefits, um, you know, matching 401k, that sort of thing. So the, um, you know, the, the, it's not just strictly the two and a half times payroll, it's two and a half times all of those costs. Yeah. So that's an important caveat. Um, we're waiting on that guidance on partnerships and LLCs and guaranteed payments. Um, and, and as Rod said, I think it's really important to get your application in now. Um, what I read is, you know, it's 349 billion and that's, that's the cap, you know, that's it when that's, when that's gone, it's gone. So, um, you know, everybody should be putting the application in now. And, um, our understanding is yes, as long as you've got your under 500 employees, you've got payroll for 2019, you still got people on staff, you should be applying for this thing. And I will tell you, everything is, is uploaded. So we have uploaded all of these documents to our website. It's under SBA heading on the, on the COVID-19 um, hub on the Nevada Trucking Association website. So all that stuff is up there. You can go right there and, and click on these things. There's a fact sheet for borrowers. There's an overview of the program. Um, have a question from Sherry. Uh, she wants some clarification on the eight week timeline. Do you have to spend all of that money in eight weeks? Brad, do you want to take that or do you? It's, uh, well, it's, it's eight weeks for the payroll component. It, it, it's an eight week program. So I'm going to say the answer is yes on that. And what, what we're doing, not that this is um, required per se, but um, we're advising clients to, if at all possible, you know, segregate those funds and pay your payroll and all the associated yeah. costs out of that same yeah. account. Yeah. And then, you know, at the end of that eight weeks, you can, you can demonstrate, you know, all the money was spent directly for those purposes and therefore the loan should be forgiven. Yeah, thank you so much for saying that. Okay, Rod, I have another question if I could. This is Laura McSwain again. Um, can you hear me? Oh yeah. Okay, great. I already um, can I... the answer though. It's 14 or it's blue okay. or it's the square root of eight. It's one of those. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, I've already submitted an application to my bank and, and it had, it was really simple to follow. They did not, they asked for sal uh, salaries, wages, commissions, reported tips, etc. cetera. Um, but they did not have any line to make any deductions for the taxes that you said can't be part of this so what do you suggest you for to make it simple just basically take everybody's net pay and submit that as the uh the wages well their gross the payroll less uh less social security medicare yeah their gro their gross pay less social security and medicare and, and less anything in excess of a hundred thousand per yes. yeah we already did yes. that okay yes. all right okay and you wouldn't want to just net pay because that might include, um, you know, deductions for retirement plan contributions, yeah. things like but that. Right. The gross right. side minus okay. uh, uh, Social Security, Medicare. Okay. And then if I could go back uh, to the other, um, the I had a question. I wasn't able to. I didn't. I'm technically challenged, so I wasn't able to click onto where I, anybody could hear me. On the previous, uh, the economic uh, injury disaster loans. Yep. Is it? Is it possible to use that for a refinance on an existing SBA? The reason why I asked is because one of the concerns that we have is what is going to happen with the economy after this all is subsides. And, um, and the loan that we have now with the SBA, it's a large loan and it casts every, uh, every quarter. And so we're subject to market conditions, you know, interest rate changes, which should we end up in a situation with a, you know, a, uh, what is the word? Interest rates drive up um, yeah. because of the problems with the economy, um, that we would then be kind of at a disadvantage because we don't have a locked in interest rate. And no, you can't use it to refinance other obligations. Okay, even if it's an SBA obligation. Correct, correct. Okay. 
All right. Okay, thank you. Yes, Laura. All right, any other questions? Oh, can I say one more thing, Paul? Yeah, of course. Um, there's, there's been, again, there's been uh, what I perceive as misinformation and one of those pieces is that you cannot apply, as of today, you cannot not apply for a PPP and an economic injury disaster loan. Don't look at me as the all-knowing expert. There is nothing that has come out, not one word, that would say that you cannot do that. You cannot um, use both of those programs to pay the same expenses, i.e. payroll, right? You can only use one or the other program to do that, but there's nothing that says you can't apply for both. Learning about SBA loans. More than you ever wanted to know. <laughs> um, one, of, one of the other benefits out there is the, um, the deferral of the 6.2% social security match. Okay. Um, and that's a deferral um, for the remainder of the year. And you don't have to pay that back. And you can pay 50% back by the end of next year and 50% by the end of the following year. But Rod, it is my understanding that um, you, you can't, is it true that you can't do that and apply for the SBA 7A? Uh, the now wait a second. Don't let's let's get rid of the seven A because that would be the sorry the PPP program. So you uh, no, I have not seen anything. I've not read anything, and I've read a way more than I normally read that would say that you can't use that program, and uh, you, you would be uh, precluded from doing the PPP and or the I the economic injury disaster loan if you did, did that on the Social Security and Medicare side. Okay. There is one other component though I forgot to talk about that was approved in the bill. And it's pretty much because it's, it's seamlessly going to work. And that is that all businesses that had, that as of March 27th had a normal SBA operating loan 7A, a 504 loan, which is for financing for fixed assets and, or a micro loan, the SBA is making the next six monthly payments on behalf of the borrowers, and that does not have to be repaid. One thing I would ask our accountants on this is whether you have any clue as to whether, because that's a gift, if you would, from the SBA, whether that is going to end up being included in your gross income. Well, I think we would, you know, obviously be looking for guidance on that. Typically, if, if there is any loan forgiveness, it is included in income. But, um, you know, with these SBA, the, the PPP forgiveness, it's actually considered a grant. So therefore not included in income. So I think we would, you know, at this point, we don't know. Okay, but that's great information. At least it gives us a sense. Mm -hmm. All right. Do we have any other questions? Is there any kind of um, guidance that's come out on the timing of when these loans will be paid? Uh, you mean when you're going to get the funds? Yes. Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, listening to Secretary recently. Mnuchin yesterday, I mean, he said, you know, as, as soon as you can, like a, a yeah. couple of, uh, you know, within a couple of weeks. So, I mean, that's, yeah. you know, that was kind of, we, we wanted, you know, it was, specific but broad so i mean I, I know they want to get the money out as fast as they can they are doing everything that they can including adopting these regulations on the fly to make sure that you know we can get this that you guys can get business can get this um money as as soon as possible so i mean i wouldn't th this is going to be a six month time frame i mean they're looking at you know days and weeks yep I had originally read the same day, but I couldn't envision walking in with a bag and having them give you money right there. So, Well, they're definitely. still proposing uh, two to three days on this PPP. Yeah. And, and, and if it becomes systematized, especially with the larger banks where, they, where, it, where it all gets uploaded, processed, boom, 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 I, it could happen, mm -hmm. at least on this. Um, I have a question to those who said they've already applied. We've um, several banks that we've talked to, they were, weren't accepting applications just yet. 
which banks are accepting applications um, for those who have already applied? Ooh, um, well, I can speak for a couple that I know absolutely. Nevada State Bank, they've already uploaded all of theirs. Wells Fargo, US Bank as well. They, people have been able to apply. It was, it was plugged into a queue. And as far as I know, hopefully today, boom, it'll go off to wherever it's going to go. I can't speak to the others. Anybody else have any, uh, any experience with that that you'd like to uh, share with the group? Heritage Bank. Okay. okay. All right, any more questions for Rod or Lucas or Darcy? And, and did you want us to cover a couple of other things? Yeah, a absolutely, please. Okay, if there's no other questions there. A um, couple of kind of ex other exciting things that are happening. Um, I, I think one of the biggest ones we're seeing with clients um, that can be hugely beneficial, just depending on your situation, is um, the change in the tax law temporarily to allow for net operating losses from 2018, 19, and 20 to be carried back five years. Um, as you may recall, recall, net operating losses used to be able to be carried back um, two years prior to last year's tax law change. Last year's tax law change um, to disallow any carry back and only carry forward and also change that, um, that if you had excess business losses, um, those could only be carried forward and offset against other business income, not um, like interest income, dividends, things like that plus another 500,000. So they've kind of scrapped all of that change temporarily. And so if you had net operating losses in 2018, you can now carry those back um, to 2014, 14, 15, Yeah, so you could, you could carry them all the way back to 14. Um, and same with 19, you can carry that back to 2015 um, and then you know, if you're looking at 2020 and saying, okay, we don't know what, you know, this might be bad this year, um, you're gonna have an opportunity if you pay taxes in the last five years um, to carry those losses back. So there's real, some real planning opportunities to recover um, tax monies that you've already paid. And we're already working on that. We're looking for guidance. There's obviously no proper forms yet to file, but you know, we're actually looking at um, developing some of our own because we've got some significant monies to recover for those years. That, that's pretty exciting. Um, Lucas, were you gonna cover the, um, the paid sick leave and that and, and the credits for that? Yeah, um, so I'm sure most of you are familiar with the, uh, there's a separate act, uh, phase two of this was the, um, the Family First Coronavirus Response Act and that had some, some mandatory paid sick leave in it for employers uh, with less than 500 employees. Um, for employers under 50 employees, there, there's been some more, we don't have full clarity on it, but there's been some more information released that um, small businesses may be able to be exempt from that uh, by applying through the Department of Labor. But uh, again, that's just something I've, I've read and I don't have specifics on that. Um, so I, I would definitely keep looking for that in coming days. Uh, under that, under that uh, act, there uh, is a required uh, paid leave um, for all of those uh, qualifying employers. And any employer that does uh, participate in that paid leave can get a credit for $200 in wages for each day an employee receives uh, qualified leave under that act. Uh, and then the required sick pay is calculated based on a range of salaries, but um, the, the range or required payment ranges from 511 to $200. Uh, and that $200 credit for wages uh, can be received in advance from the IRS. They're expected to receive uh, forms related to that and guidance on how employers can start applying for those uh, advance refunds of those, those payroll tax credits uh, in the coming days, but they haven't released any detailed guidelines yet. Uh, Darcy mentioned that employee retention credit uh, against Medicare uh, social security taxes of up to five thousand uh, dollars and uh, deferring any of those social security payments uh, up to 
uh, December 31st of 2021 and December 31st of 2022. Um, there's also the tax rebate payments I'm sure a lot of you heard about with uh, $1,200 for each adult who's filed the tax return. So that's $2,400 for married filing joint couples and then $500 for each child. There's some AGI limits on that, uh, $75,000 for single filers, $112,000 for head of household and $150,000 for married filing joint. It's phased out above those levels um, for the next $25,000 if you're single and the next $50,000 if you're married filing joint. So if you're above $100,000 for filing single or above $200,000 of AGI for filing joint, those rebates are phased out. And that's a rebate against 2020 tax. So when you file your 2020 tax return, if you receive those rebates, that's when that income will be reconciled to determine whether or not you were overpaid or underpaid. Um, there uh, is an increase of unemployment. Uh, the pandemic unemployment is part of that bill as well. It's an increase of $600 a week um, for 39 weeks. And uh, there's also, we don't have great clarity on it yet, but there's going to be unemployment available to self-employed individuals and sole proprietors. Um, and that, uh, I've been told that website uh, to apply for that federal unemployment for self-employed individuals should be coming online very soon. Um, advanced retirement account distributions. So uh, if you're under 50, or I'm sorry, yeah, anyone under uh, 59 and a half years old can take up to $100,000 from retirement accounts as an advanced distribution. There's no 10% penalty for those early distributions and they can either repay that over the next three years or recognize it as income over the next three years, uh, equally in the next three years. So uh, just a, a way to get access to, to cash if it's needed to get through this. Uh, there's no RMDs in 2020. So for anyone who's required over 70 and a half are required to be taking RMDs if their stock portfolio is taking a hit, uh, they can be liquidating any of those investments at the low market value that they're currently at for 2020 and, and not have to actually take any RMDs out of those accounts. Um, <clears throat> there's been a correction for qualified improvement property, uh, where it allows basically leasehold improvements that used to be depreciated over 15 years can now be expensed immediately. Uh, there's a $300 above the line charitable deduction for taxpayers who don't typically itemize deductions. So anyone who's given $300 to charity can deduct that even if they're taking the standard deduction of the year. Um, and the AGI limitations for charitable contributions have been modified for 2020 to 100% of AGI for individuals and 25% of taxable income for corporations. Uh, so that's a, a significant increase. And I think um, that correction, um, Lucas, that correction on being able to expense up, expense 15-year um, property is retroactive to 18, correct? Oh, okay. Yeah. So you could go right. back and amend returns if you and, and take that accelerated depreciation if you're in that situation. Um, thank you, Darcy. Uh, and then HSAs and FSAs uh, can now be used for over-the-counter medicine and they've expanded the uh, benefits that you can use to pay for those accounts. Uh, and then if you have a federally held student loan, uh, the payments have been suspended through September 30th, 2020 and interest won't be accruing during that period. And that relief doesn't apply to private student loans. It's only ones guaranteed uh, federally. And uh, the last thing is uh, the interest deduction limitation under section 163J. If, you're, if this applies to you, you're very familiar with it, but um, that interest deduction limitation has been increased from 30% of taxable income to 50% of taxable income for the tax years of 2019 and 2020. Hey, Lucas, Darcy, thank you guys so much. Rod, thank you. Let, let me just ask, I mean, here, here's kind of my last thing that I would recommend to folks. Talk to your bank today. You know, go in there, talk to your banker now. Talk to your accountants. You can see, you know, how much information, you know, ours have. Um, you know, if you don't have one, we've got great people right here online who, uh, I'm sure you guys aren't very busy right now, right? With taxes being deferred. No, but you know, if anybody has any questions, we're happy to answer. I mean, even if you already have an accounting, I'm sure you have an accounting relationship, we're happy to answer any questions. Um, you know, it's busy, but you know, it's the new normal for us. So it's, 
perfectly fine. We're happy to have jobs, right? A amen. Exactly. Hey, I, I, I also, um, Rod, thank you very much. Rod, do you have any, you know, last kind of things to, to tell our folks out there? Uh, I think I'm good until the next shoe drops on all of this stuff. Well, I, I may ask you to come back next week, you know, in case yeah. there, there's, there's any changes. And we are doing these, um, you know, every Friday now at 930 to just keep everybody informed of where we're at. You know, once again, we do have the hand sanitizer um, that we got from a Frey Ranch distillery. They've got great gin. They've got great bourbon. They've got vodka, which I don't drink. Um, but, you know, if you do imbibe, um, it would be a nice thank you to them for donating the 20 gallons. If you want to come by our office, uh, we'll give you we'll give you some stuff. We're sending some stuff out to Vegas today. We have gloves. Um, I know there's been a request for masks. Masks are tough, but we're gonna see what we can do. And you know, I just want to say thank you to everybody. I really appreciate the time and attention. And if you have any questions or anything you'd like us to do please reach out to me. My cell phone is always on. The only time I won't answer it is, well, you, you saw that a little last week, but try not to answer it during these, uh, during these Zoom meetings. Um, and I guess we're very blessed that we don't have, uh, we didn't have any Zoom, buddy Zoom bomb us. Yeah. Um, any other hey, Polly, questions, Dan? I do yeah, have- Polly, this is, this is Bruce McRae. I was wondering, is, uh, is Rob McRae on? Are you still on, Rob? It's not my brother. He's one of my partners. He may already be off. I'll send you. A, I'll send you an email on his question, Polly. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. I do have one question, if you don't mind. Is anybody familiar with this letter for essential employees? So, Mary, you know there there is there has been a lot of rumors that you need a letter, and in some jurisdictions, in California, where you have local jurisdictions with different you know, differing restrictions, they've asked for a letter. I know that my friends of the California so Trucking Association put a letter together. A letter is not required. You don't need to have a letter saying that you're an essential employee. Um, we do have stuff on our website that does show trucking as essential under um, CISA, which is the Cyber Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Act. We are essential. Trucking is essential. I have not heard of any problems in the state of Nevada. I've heard rumors, you know, in California, Arizona, Utah, that they're stopping folks and asking to see a letter. Those rumors have all turned out to be BS. There's going to be a lot of that dur during this time. Um, we do have a rumor control link on our website. Um, you don't need a letter. Um, but if you want to see what they have with CISA, I'm happy to provide that to you. And I've been hesitant to put a letter out there because I don't want somebody to think, oh my God, if I don't have this letter, I can't do anything. You absolutely can. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, all right. And then, hey, I just want to say thank you. Thank you guys. Um, so, so very much. Um, Really appreciate it. I know we've had a request for posters on how to clean your truck, on you know how to wash your hands for drivers. I have um, one of our very able partners, um, Shauna Stafford, who is going to be putting one together for us. So we'll have that posted next week, so you can print it off and you can hang it in your, uh, you know, in your bathrooms, you know, in the in the shop. So you know we have all that information for you. So if there's anything else you need please let me know. Um, I just want to say once again, thank you. Appreciate everybody's time and feel free to reach out with any questions, concerns, issues that uh, you guys are coming up against. Thank everybody. Safe travels and Godspeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Thanks for doing this, Paul. Thank you.